Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is an interesting one entitled Resting in Christ. And this particular lesson for August 7 of 2021 is number six in this series entitled Finding Rest in Family Ties. I think we're going to have a little problem with the finding rest in these family ties. This is actually the story of the early years of Joseph. We'll see what we can learn. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we bow in your presence, recognizing how much we depend upon you, how much we need you in every day's experience. Be with us now as we think about this very important story from the book of Genesis. Guide us as we talk about it is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This story will focus on the story of Jacob's family with emphasis on the story of Joseph. For starters, let us, starters, let us review the fact that Isaac and Rebekah had twin sons. While Rebekah, was, while Rebekah favored Jacob, Isaac preferred Esau. Oh dear. You can see there's a problem brewing already. This was not the first dysfunctional family situation in that line. Remember that Sarah had not produced an heir by, until, uh, by late in her life. So she encouraged Abraham to take Hagar as a secondary wife, and Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. Then later, following God's miraculous actions, Sarah finally gave birth to Isaac. From that point on, there was conflict, which continues to this day, as you all know if you know something about what's going on in the Middle East from time to time. So what do we know about the story of Jacob? Jacob was about, you know, we think, okay, here's this young guy, maybe he's early 20s or something like that. He's fleeing away from home because his brother wants to kill him. How old was he? <laughs> Jacob was about 70 years old when he fled from his parents' home, fleeing from Esau and looking for a wife at Haran. He worked for seven years and was given Leah. Then he promised to work seven more years and was given Rachel a week later as his second wife. Wow. Joseph was born about 21 years later. You mean he went through two weddings in a week? Yes. <laughs> yes, he did. And I don't know whether he had weddings with those other two. Each of them gave their handmaids to him to produce more descendants for the, uh, for on their side, if possible. Just crazy. Okay, so how do we come to these numbers? Moses does not tell us the age, age of Jacob at the birth of Joseph, but he very neatly works it into the story. Genesis 41, 40, we'll look at these verses in just a moment. Genesis 41, 46, 45, 6, and 47, 9. So that by simple addition and subtraction, we find it to be 91. How old was Jacob when Joseph was born? 91. 91. We are expected to do the, su the sum for ourselves. So if you want to read the book of Genesis, you better be good with your math. Well, no, it's not the math that's so difficult. It's being reading very carefully what it says and realizing how the verses fit together. So let's try it. Joseph, Genesis 41, 46. Jim? Joseph was 30 years old when he began to serve the king of Egypt. He left the king's court, traveled all over the land. American Bible Society, 1992. Okay. Joseph was 30 years old when he began to serve the king of Egypt. Now, this is Joseph, okay? Genesis 45, verse 6. Carrie? After the seven years of plenty and just two years of famine... Joseph said to his brothers... Okay, now, I'm going to interrupt here. We've got to do the math. So he was 30 years old when what happened? When he started. When, when he started to serve the king of Egypt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, m how many more years have gone by? Nine more years. Seven years of plenty and two years of famine. Okay, so he's now 39, right? Yeah. Okay, go ahead, read the passage. This is only the second year of famine in the land. There will be five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor reaping. That's some good news, okay. Bible. Okay, now 
Charles, Genesis 47, Genesis 47 9. 47 9, Jacob answered, My life of wandering has lasted 130 years. Okay, Those hold years, on now. Now we have to do our math. 130 years. Now this is, now the, they have come down to Egypt. It's in the second year of the famine. Jacob has finally arrived in Egypt and he says, his life has been how long so far? 130. 130 years. So we have to subtract the nine years. That takes us back to what? 121. 121. Then we have to subtract the 30 years that Moses was when he, I mean, I'm sorry, that Joseph was when he started working for the king. So that takes us back to? 91. 91. So Jacob was 91 years old, as if we assume that this is, these numbers are correct, which I do. Uh, when Joseph was born. And Benjamin was much younger. Benjamin was even younger. Wow. Does this make it easier or more difficult for us to understand Jacob's relationship to Joseph? I mean, he should be working on great-grandchildren by this time. Of course, he Joseph... He probably was with the older kids. <laughs> he might have been. Well, no, because he, the oldest one could... could Let's see, he couldn't have been more than about 14 years older than, than Joseph. If I'm at maximum 20, we don't know exactly where they came along on the scene. But, uh, could it be that he waited all these years because he wanted to go back to his people to marry someone and not one of these hidden... Well, that uh, seemed to be the advice from his mother and his father, didn't it? Yes. It doesn't say specifically that that's why he waited. Well, but, he could have gone there long before he was 70. Yeah. And he waited until his brother had married Canaanite wives and caused all sorts of trouble for his parents. And then I guess he thought, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't marry one of these women here. Well, maybe he was the pet of his mom. You know, he just... I am pretty sure of that. <laughs> of course, Joseph was the eldest son of... Jacob's favorite wife. It was really readily apparent as Joseph grew up that he was the favorite of his elderly father. And this is my favorite wife here. Yeah, right, <laughs> exactly. I have one too. His older brothers, the sons of Leah and the two handmaidens, were not happy about Jacob's favoritism to Joseph. Then Joseph, number four, then Joseph was given that special coat which some translations say it had multiple colors, while others' translations say it had long sleeves. So there's two different ways to translate the words there. Then the day came when Joseph was sent by his father to see how his brothers were doing. He traveled a long distance on foot, probably several days' journey, and finally found them in Dothan. But the greeting he received certainly was not a pleasant one. Some of the brothers wanted him dead, other brothers suggested selling him into slavery and making a little money as they got rid of him. And so they did. And just real quickly, what was one of the main reasons why they were so upset at him? His dream. He was a dreamer. Oh, it wasn't that he was a dreamer. It was that he told his dreams to, to his brothers <laughs> yeah. and, and his father. And, and then he mother. interpreted them. Yeah. Oh no, his father interpreted them, I guess. Wow. The sons of Jacob had a very sordid history which it came to, when, it, when it came to choosing Canaanite wives. In Genesis 34, we read about the rape of Dinah, Jacob's only daughter. She, you know, here she has 12 brothers. You know, I don't know, Myra, do you think she would like to have a girl to play with once in a while? Yeah. Maybe. And so she went to the local village to find some young ladies that she could spend some time with. While there... She was raped by the son of the head of the, the village. As a result of deceit and trickery, and we won't go into all the details of how that happened, the entire village where they lived was destroyed by giant Dinah's older brothers. They said, we're not having any of these Canaanite characters rape our sister. Then there was Judah, the one who would eventually be the forerunner of Jesus Christ. Judah's young Canaanite wife bore him three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. We do not know exactly what happened to his older sons. The scripture simply says that they displeased the Lord and so the Lord killed them. Genesis 38, 6-10. Now all you scholars, 
people who know all, have read all the way through the Bible several times, what does it mean what says the Lord killed him? They were killed and the Lord was... Okay, was remember awful. that in ancient times, the basic idea was if something happens and you can't immediately explain it on the basis of something human, it must have been God that did it. So that's what's happening here. Now, that doesn't tell us why they died, but... Uh, let's if hope. they had a congenital heart defect with arrhythmias... Maybe. No, it had to be something with neurology, not with yeah. cardiology, sir. Come on. <laughs> they had, they had AV, both of them had they, AVMs, they were, AVMs they were. and ruptured. And Arnold, died. Arnold Carrier or something like that. But, yeah. you know, so you see, uh, we must be living in ancient days even now because anything bad happens, it must be an act of God. Yeah, yeah it says that in the insurance policy, right? Yeah. Flood. Or, yeah. or fire. Yeah, yeah. If the house yeah. burns down, it's an act of God. Yeah, sure. since we are on this. You know, when was the last time you preached or you heard a sermon on the dysfunctional family of God? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that what we're yeah. going through? I mean, that's what we're talking about. That's right. I like that statement. It says that uh, God is accused of doing that which he does not prevent and that which he allows. Yeah. And I didn't make that up. It's just yeah. uh, something we were in. Yeah. But it is true, though. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's simple. Yeah. Just, yeah, but the, well, you read through the Bible, it says God did this, God did that. Well, I mean, and obviously the statement is true because we do believe that God is all-powerful. So he if could he, prevent all these things. He could have prevented it if, he, if it was really important for him to do so. Yeah, just to spend a little bit more time on this, here is Moses who is writing this, that God killed. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, so many times you'll find in translations, it'll, it's, it's, the conclusion is God did something, but you could say that God allowed it. God, it does, you, many okay. times you'll see eight words that are translated from, in, in English out of one Hebrew word. Mm. And then you got a one Hebrew word that could be translated 75 different ways. The word A-S-A-H or A-S-A -A is it 75 different meanings. I learned that many years ago. So the, the, the Hebrew language isn't all that word well, for it, word. You can't do well, it Well, the, the point is that Hebrew language was, in ancient Hebrew, the, what we know of it, had a very limited vocabulary. Right. So words had multiple meanings. So it's, now, we do this according to perhaps our own concept mm -hmm. of a loving yeah, Heavenly Father. Paradigm. And God mm -hmm. hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Again and again. So someone well, who is one of the best to harden his own heart. Yeah, they are, right? Yeah, well, it says that right in the same within three verses there. Yes. Look at um, Exodus nine and ten, the end of nine and the beginning of ten. But the clearest example of that is the death of Saul. Right. It's described in in First Samuel thirty, I believe it was 20, thirty chapter thirty, and First Chronicles chapter ten. And right there it says God killed him. And then we know that he fell on his sword and died, basically what we would call a suicide. Of course, he was already fatally wounded from the, from the uh, Philistines. Right. And we assume an arrow, something like that. So who killed him? The Philistines, his suicide, or God? Well, you can, God had abandoned him because he was, he was asking for the witch of Endor to give him guidance. Okay, well, anyway... Judah was not sure what to do with his widowed daughter-in-law, so he sent her home to stay at her father's house. Her name was Tamar. Later, Judah's daughter-in-law played the role of a prostitute when Judah was coming by. She heard that he was coming by that and coming by that area, so she went out, put, of course, wore a veil and so forth, so he couldn't see her, and was dressed like a prostitute. She disguised herself as a prostitute. He slept with her not realizing who she was. When if he had realized who it was, well, <laughs> yeah. he slept with a prostitute. Yes. Isn't that bad enough? Yes. But what comes next is even worse. He slept with her, not realizing who she was. When Judah found out that she was pregnant, he determined that she should be killed. Then she showed the staff and the seal that Judah had given her in lieu of payment. Then it was revealed that Judah was the father of her twins, and one of her two sons carried the birthright tradition that would lead to Jesus Christ. 
Uh oh. Apparently, God is not all that concerned with with what people do sexually, but if they do something by force, through force or violence, it might be the problem of in in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. It was the violence, and there the, the, the was there was the real big thing. Despite these, it was actually, as I recall from, I think it's in Isaiah, he said. It was the way they treated the widows and the poor. That's Ezekiel 16. Yeah. 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 That, that yeah, Sodom and Gomorrah was right. destroyed because that of that. That was Ezekiel 16. Yeah. Despite these stories, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are listed in Hebrews 11, 17 to 22 as heroes of faith. Does that sound right to you? Amen. It's not. I mean, it's, it's just <laughs> not right. But that's what grace is. Yeah. You see, that's what grace is. Look at, look at, and the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Yep. Until the silo, the Messiah comes. That's grace. Yeah. Let us not forget that all of us are sinners. Yes. Even yeah. the heroes of faith made major mistakes in their lives. That's the beauty. They're yeah. not in the chapter on heroes of faith because of their mistakes but rather because of their repentance and return to a amen. faith relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Now you can all say amen. Yes, amen. amen. Let us turn now to the story of Joseph. Try to imagine yourself with Joseph, probably bound in some way or another, traveling either on a donkey, a horse, a camel, or perhaps just walking on his way to Egypt with his captors. He had been the favored son of a wealthy father. Then he was headed for slavery. Hmm. Meanwhile... Joseph, with his captors, was on his way to Egypt. As the caravan journeyed southward toward the borders of Canaan, the boy could discern in the distance the hills among which lay his father's tents. Bitterly he wept at the thought of that loving father in his loneliness and affliction. Again, the scene at Dotham came up before him. He saw his angry brothers and felt their fierce glances bent against him. The stinging, insulting words that were, had meant his agonizing in, entreaties were ringing in his ears. With a trembling heart, he looked forward to the future. What a change in situation from the tender, tenderly cherished son to the despised, helpless slave. Alone and friendless, what would be his lot in the strange land in which he was going? For a time, Joseph gave himself up to uncontrolled grief and terror. Then his thoughts turned to his, heavenly, his father's God. In his childhood, he had been taught to love and fear him. Often, his father's tent, had, he had listened to the story of the vision that Jacob saw when he fled from his home, an, an exile and a fugitive. Now all of the precious lessons came vividly before him. Joseph believed that the God of his father, fathers would be his God. He then and there gave himself fully to the Lord, and he prayed that the keeper of Israel would be with him in the land of his exile. Wow. Ellen G. White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page. There's the key. He then and there gave himself fully to the Lord, and he prayed that the keeper of Israel would be with him in the land of his exile. So yeah. what happened? As you've mentioned before, we picture both Jacob and Joseph when, when they're fleeing or in, yeah. in exile being young people. Jacob was 71. Is that what we decided? Jacob was 70. 70. Yeah. And Joseph here is probably a teenager. Yeah. So quite different. Yeah. Joseph must have been incredibly upset and saddened by these events. Do you suppose that as, as they passed not too far from his father's tents in southern Canaan, he tried to convince the Ishmaelites to take him over there, explaining that his father would pay a lot more money for him than they would ever get in Egypt? I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't that be the obvious thing to say? Just right over there. In some cultures, emphasis is placed on the role of the community in influencing a child. Other communities focus more on the individual's personal development. Ideally, there should be a balance of Christian influences in each child's life. So what made the difference in Joseph's life? 
On that sorry journey to Egypt, Joseph grew up. He made a definite decision to follow God. Right through the Old Testament, we see multiple verses emphasizing the importance of individual choice in following God. And there's just some few examples. Deuteronomy 4.29, Joshua 24.15, 1 Chronicles 16.11, Psalm 14, verse 2, Proverbs 8.10, and Isaiah 55, verse 6. That's just some examples. It is very important for each one of us to recognize that God has only children, but no grandchildren. What do we mean when we say that God has only children and no grandchildren? It's our own relationship with God that makes the difference. It isn't our parents' relationship or our grandparents' relationship. We can't save our children or our grandchildren either. They have to have the relationship for themselves. That is, we cannot be saved by the faith or good works of our parents or grandparents. We can only be saved by our own personal relationship with God. And what's the word we use to describe that personal relationship with God? Faith. Well, there's several of them. Faith is the most common one used in the Bible. Trust is another one. When Joseph reached Egypt, he was sold into the service of the captain of Pharaoh's guard, an Egyptian. We do not know if Joseph at that point knew any Egyptian language or not. It was certainly a new culture with which he was unfamiliar. How was he going to respond to this new situation? Did he think that he would, ever, he would never again see his elderly father? In any case, he determined that he was going to be faithful to his father's God. Joseph chose to establish his self-worth by his relationship to God. And I need to stop here for a second and remind you that it was a common belief in those days that there's a different God for each country. So a lot of people would have said, well, if you go to Egypt, you have to start worshiping the Egyptian gods. You can't worship to the, to you can't worship the Israelite god in Egypt. He's back over there in Israel. Well, how are we to find our self worth in God? Does it help to know that God wants to treat us as His own children? Look at what the Bible says about how God views each one of us. Isaiah forty three one. Israel, the Lord who who created you, says, "Do not be afraid. I will save you." I have called you by name. You are mine. Hmm. You want me to keep going? Yeah, go ahead. Malachi 3.17. They will be my people, says the Lord Almighty. On the day when I act, they will be my very own. I will be merciful to them as a father is merciful to the son who serves him. John 1.12. Some, however, did receive him and believed in him. So he gave them the right to become God's children. John 15, 15, Jesus said, I do not call you servants any longer because servants do not know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends because I have told you everything I have heard from my father. And Romans 8, 14, those who are led by God's spirit are God's children. And 1 John 3, 1 and 2. See how much the Father has loved us? His love is so great that we are called God's children, and so in fact we are. This is why the world does not know us. It has not known Him. It has not known God. My dear friends, we are now God's children, but it is not yet clear what we shall become. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him because we shall see him as he really is. All wow. of those from the Good News Bible. Wow, wow. So it's clear through many parts of the Bible, clear through the Old Testament, clear through the New Testament, that God loves us. He wants us to follow him. He wants to claim us as his children. Well, now let's talk about some things that are overriding in our understanding of God. God is omniscient. What is omniscient? All-knowing. All-knowing. He knows every detail of every person's life as well as all the details of everything happening in the entire universe. But when it comes to looking at his human children, he sees us through grace-tinted glasses. No matter what, I mean, 
imagine God's up there in heaven and he's looking at the angels who are there praising his name, thanking him all the time, ready to do his will at an instant notice. And then he looks at us who are rebelling against him, carrying on our sinful lives, doing all these other things like this. And which one of us is God going like, to love most, the angel or us? <laughs> wow. No matter what we have done or how difficult our life has been, God will accept us and treat us like royalty if we will just accept his calls and come back faithfully to him. How are we supposed to respond to the reality of God's love? Many books have been written in our day about accepting our self-worth, accepting our self-worth and, and how to grow our self-worth. They even suggest we should accept ourselves uncritically. Is that really self-deception? What if we recognize that our only real worth comes from our relationship with our Heavenly Father? He is the one who made us and understands our true potential. Look at Genesis 39, 1-6. Now let's go back to the Joseph story, having given that background. Now the Ishmaelites had taken Joseph to Egypt and sold him to Potiphar, one of the king's officers who was the captain of the palace guard. So obviously someone who was very close to Pharaoh himself. The Lord was with Joseph and made him successful. He lived in the house of his Egyptian master, who saw that the Lord was with Joseph and had made him successful in everything he did. Potiphar was pleased with him and made him his personal servant. So he put him in charge of his house and everything he owned. From then on, because of Joseph, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian and everything that he had in his house and in his fields. Potiphar handed over everything he had to the care of Joseph and did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Joseph was well built and good looking. Oh dear, the Good News Bible. Joseph had survived being thrown into a pit, being sold to his, by his brothers into slavery. He had risen to a high position in the household of one of Pharaoh's close associates. At that point, he was probably exposed to a lot of details about how to behave and what things were acceptable in Pharaoh's household. So he was getting an education here. But trouble was brewing in Potiphar's house. Jim? Genesis 39, verses 7 to 10. And after a while, his master's wife began to desire Joseph and asked him to go to bed with her. He refused and said to her, Look, my master does not have to, does not have to concern himself with anything in the house, because I am here. He has put me in charge of everything he has. I have as much authority in this house as he has, and he has not kept back anything from me except you. How then could I do th such a thing, such an immoral thing, and sin against God? Although she asked Joseph day after day, he would not go to bed with her. Good News Bible. Wow. Well, Joseph was good looking and well built, and Potiphar's wife could not keep her eyes off him. She repeatedly tried to lure them into her bed. But Joseph had determined to live according to God's standards and not be influenced by other humans around him. Okay, Carrie? Uh, reading from Genesis 39, verses 11 to 21. But one day when Joseph went into the house to do his work, none of the house servants were there. She caught him by his robe and said, Come to bed with me. But he escaped and ran outside, leaving his robe in her hand. When she saw that he had left his robe and run out of the house, she called her house servants and said, Look at this, this Hebrew that my husband brought to the house is insulting us. He came into my room and tried to rape me, but I screamed as loud as I could. When he heard me scream, he ran outside, leaving his robe beside me. Wow. She kept his robe with her until Joseph Master came home. Then she told him the same story. The Hebrew slave that you bought here came into my room and insulted me. And when I screamed, he ran outside, leaving his robe beside me. Joseph's master was furious and had Joseph arrested and put in prison where the king's prisoners were kept, and there he stayed. 
but the Lord was with Joseph and blessed him so that the jailer was pleased with him. Joseph... Okay, now we're going to go from the Good News Bible to Ellen White. She comments about this story. Joseph suffered for his integrity, for his attempt to revenge herself by accusing him of a foul crime and causing him to be thrust into prison. Had Potiphar believed his wife's charge against Joseph, the young Hebrew would have lost his life. But the modesty and uprightness that had uniformly characterized his conduct were proof of his innocence. And yet, to save the reputation of his master's house, he was abandoned to disgrace and bondage. This is wow. Patriarchs and prophets. So let's be clear about this story. Joseph is in prison not because he'd done anything wrong, but because he'd done everything right. So was his prior... Yes? He's in prison because of the lies of the wife of, of mm. Potiphar. Yeah. Was Joseph's prior behavior really proof of his innocence? Yes. Could a person change? Was it really proof or was it just... Evidence he of He just innocence. wouldn't have done that. But, yeah, they, but they, people they, say that about criminals now. You know? yeah. And it's just not true. But, but there may have been other evidence that we don't know that maybe the yeah. wife... I, I'm sure there was. Yes, the husband knew. But, but I, luckily, think the, I think the husband knew his wife as yes. well as he knew Joseph. Yeah. Like, yeah. And luckily, this was Joseph and not Judah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so true. Brothers. <laughs> Brothers. <laughs> yes. There was nothing fair about what happened to Joseph. But notice that if Potiphar had really believed his wife's story, mm. Joseph would have been killed. Joseph's life had gone from privileged son to slave, to privileged manager, to prisoner. But he quickly worked his way up to be recognized as a reliable assistant to the prison warden. And you can read about that with a long passage you won't take time to read. Genesis 39, 21 to 40, verse 22. Then there were Pharaoh's butler and baker who had dreams. Joseph correctly interpreted those dreams. The baker was killed and the butler was returned to the, pa to the palace. Uh, that should have been palace, I think, and not place. Serving Pharaoh, Joseph had begged the butler when he was returning to his position with Pharaoh to speak on his behalf to see if he could be released from prison. Two years went by. Just no problem, just two years in prison. But, you know, the Lord allows us even today, to go through trying times to prepare us for his service. Two years in prison? Two, more than two years. I mean, look at what he's yeah. gone through. Yep. <clears throat> but God was certainly not finished with his plans for Joseph. One day he gave a dream to Pharaoh. You know, I, I'm looking forward to the day when we get to heaven and we can say, God, <laughs> why, why, why did you do that? And God will smile and say, here, here's the rest of the story. Yeah. Right. When I was in college, I used to uh, carry a portable radio with me at lunchtime. And I used to listen to Paul Harvey, and you know, he's famous for his stories. He'd tell the whole thing, and then mm. this is the rest of the story. Yeah. And I'm sure God has a lot of rest of stories to tell us. <laughs> his wife was an Adventist? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, one of the stories I'd like to hear is Naaman's little servant girl who was yeah. an orphan. Yes. Look at the look at the tremendous impact. Yeah. She had on his life. I when I was a senior in college, we had the privilege of having. Um, oh, I just lost. I forgot his name. Um, the radio guy. Paul Harvey. Harvey. Paul Harvey. Yeah. yeah. Paul Harvey come to give a presentation at, at Walla Walla College where I was attending at that point in time, now Walla Walla University. And he got up, I'll never forget, there were, there were the band played and the choir sang and there were all kinds of introductions, you know how they would make a big deal. This was a great occasion for this, co for this college place. And he got up, he said, I feel like the Okefenokee farm boy that fell into a barrel of molasses. He said, Lord, 
give me a mouth for the occasion. <laughs> <laughs> never, never forget those words after all that Lord give me a mouth for the occasion <laughs> well now God takes action and he gives a dream to Pharaoh and the dream seemed to be repeated there were seven fat cattle that were consumed apparently by seven lean even bony cattle and there were seven fat kernels of grain that seemed to have been consumed by seven lean withered kernels what could these dreams possibly mean? Then, two years later, as we already mentioned, the butler remembered that Joseph could interpret dreams. And what was the result? As we know, Joseph was able to interpret the dream and was, therefore, chosen to be the one in charge of the surplus crops for the next seven years so the people of Egypt would have food during the famine that was coming. It's quite possible that, and this is a little side bit of information, at that time, the rulers of Egypt, known as the Hyksos, were actually a Semitic group whose language was similar to Joseph's mother tongue. So maybe they felt quite comfortable in inviting Joseph into the royal priest household anyway. Well, the Bible has some comments about that kind of thing. James 1, 5, but if any of you lack wisdom, you should pray to God who will give it to you, because God gives generously and graciously to all. When we get into difficult situations, do we think of this verse? Does this promise apply to all of us? Have you tried it? Ellen White from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1. Here is an example to all generations who should live on the earth. God will be a present help and his spirit a shield. Although, shrouded, although surrounded with the severest temptations, there is a source of strength to which they can apply and resist them. How fierce was the assault upon Joseph's morals. It came from one of influence, the most likely to lead astray. Yet, how promptly and firmly was it resisted. He had placed his reputation and interest in the hands of God, and although he had and although he was suffered to be afflicted for a time to prepare him to fill an important position, yet God safely guarded that reputation that was blackened by the wicked accuser and afterward in his own good time caused it to shine. I want to stop there for just a second. As we look back on it, as far as we understand, that decision in the fleeting second there is change the whole course of human history. I mean, what if he had said, okay, and disappeared into Egyptian society? Now, God might have worked things out in some other way, but the story as we know it changed complete course because of that decision in a moment there. Okay, go ahead. God made even the prison the way to his elevation. Virtue will in time bring its own reward. The shield which covered Joseph's heart was the fear of God, which caused him to be faithful and just to his master and true to God. He despised that ingratitude which would lead him to abuse his master's con uh, confidence, although his master might never learn the fact. Fear Prophecy, Volume 1, page 132. Um, do you think either Potiphar or his wife ever had to come and ask Joseph for food? Hmm. They sent their ne next Joseph. Their next Joseph, I see, okay. <laughs> well, it's a very interesting question. So what should we learn from the experience, this experience of Joseph so far? We have a lot more about Joseph coming up, but Joseph went from pit to prison, to palace. How's that for a mm. sequence? Pit to prison to palace. Not many of us are going to have those kinds of experiences. But what about those who are nominal or cultural Adventists versus those who are true believers? Can you tell the difference in sitting in church? What is the difference? Well, cultural Adventist just goes through the motions of being an Adventist. They are that way because 
They're on the bus, as Dr. Maxwell used to say. I'm born on the bus. They think the bus is headed for the kingdom, and so let me ride along. I don't have to do anything, just ride along. True believers, by con contrast, develop a trusting relationship with God. Russian author Leo Tolstoy wrote, All happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. All families, to one degree or another, suffer dysfunction because all are made of sinners, each one bringing their own dysfunction into the family relationship. How can each one of us, by God's grace, seek to follow biblical principles of love, forgiveness, burden-bearing, and so forth to bring some healing to our family relationship? How can we do that? That's from our Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Things may be going well for us right at this moment. Does that mean that there will not be problems in the future? Of course not. Are we getting prepared? We know that the seven last plagues are coming, and there will be a lot of problems before that happens. Are we preparing? Did you have a domineering father or mother, or perhaps even a bit of an abusive one? Did you have a significant, uh, significant, did you have significant sibling rivalries? As adults, what is your relationship with your siblings or with your parents? I'm, I'm sure every one of us could stop now and talk about families where there wasn't sibling rivalry, that they got along well with their parents and the children did great. And we could talk about other families where there was all kinds of problems of various kinds and Maybe in some cases the still children, children still did great, but not so, other cases not so great. Or with your parents. Do you always get along great with your parents? There are at least two lessons that we should learn from the experience of Joseph, and there, there obviously could be more. We may face a lot of difficulties. That does not mean that God has abandoned us. I mean, why did God think it was necessary to allow Joseph to go through that whole sequence? Did God just stand back and let things happen? Or do you think God had something to do with asking Jacob to ask Joseph to walk up to Dothan to find his brothers? Just for example, what if he had not done that? What if Jacob had understood a little more clearly the animosity that his brothers had for Joseph. Hmm. What if he had not favored Joseph so clearly? What if Joseph had not had those dreams? I mean, think of all the ifs. You know, maybe if Joseph hadn't had those dreams, his brothers wouldn't have been so upset with him. Or if he just hadn't told his family about those dreams. Or maybe if even his father hadn't interpreted them so obviously. <laughs> wow. Think of all the incredible, I mean, did God work that whole thing out, every single detail to make it come out like this? Well, God loves every one of his children. We know that. And that's the good children, the good children and the bad children. And he will do whatever is necessary to bring us to that faith relationship that he desires that we would have with him. If, of course, we are willing to cooperate. Yeah, within uh, within yeah. the realm of, within the bounds of human freedom, God works to the goal that he wants to accomplish. And why do you suppose God refuses to, mis, well, I was going to say misuse, refuses to over, overwhelm our freedom? If we're not free, we can't love. That's right. If we're not free, we can't love. And God is love. He has to operate at every point in accordance with his basic tenor of his kingdom. And that's love. Does God compel? No, he doesn't. I was re re going to some quotes about uh, God. Com compulsion is not part of God's operation. Yep. But unfortunately, many stories are read and, and, and are written as if God's doing that to scare the daylight out of you so yeah. you knuckle under and... Well, Joseph's story is a beautiful example of what Ellen White said about uh, 
why the Lord allows us to go through suffering. She says, suffering is an able tool in the hands of our loving God to draw us yeah. closer to Him. Beautiful yeah. statement. Beautiful statement. Well, you've got Genesis 1, uh, 26 and 28. Get, take, have dominion, take dominion over the, over the earth, everything. So, and it doesn't, the passage isn't there. It says, well, but it'll look out. If you don't do it my way, you're not going to have hell to pay. Yeah. Often the serious challenges we face are allowed by God, notice, allowed by God, to prepare us for something even greater in the future. How many of the things that happened to Joseph prepared him for his final job? Hmm. Well, God has a plan for each one of his children, and he works in various ways to work things out to be the best possible result. Was Egypt was a world... It was, Egypt was, the, was the most powerful nation in the world at that point. Yes, and during Daniel's time... It was Babylon. Babylon was... And Medo-Persia. There you are, right. And he was on, what, four kingdoms that he was... Uh, or four kings, right, that he was active yeah, during? in Babylon and Babylon. then in, in Medo-Persia. Medo -Persia. Right, right. Two very interesting authors, Victor and Mildred George Goetzel, have written a book entitled Cradles of Eminence. I just got the book and have started reading it. It's very inter interesting. It's an expansion on previous books studying the childhood times of famous eminent people. What do we mean by an eminent person? Scientists. People who stand out. Yeah. People who stand out for one reason. Some of them are scientists, some are politicians, some are movie stars, some are entrepreneurs, authors, playwrights, even sports heroes. Many of these famous Americans suffered childhood trauma. Some were, were quite sick. Some of them came up through dysfunctional families. I mean, to talk about a person who had every disadvantage you could just you could almost imagine, think about Helen Keller. Right. Yeah. And yet, I mean, virtually everybody's heard of Helen Keller. Helen Keller. Um, others experienced significant childhood injuries. Others were raised in loving, supportive families. But each of those who became prominent made choices that led him or her to where she or he ended up. Hmm. I uh, tell you just a thing or two about my experience as a child. I was raised and went to school in a tiny little school. The entire school had 29 students, two teachers, 29 students, all eight grades. That was a primary school. Our entire library had about 50 books, I think, <laughs> at school. And it so happened my father was drafted into the Air Force. So he went for three months to the, down to San, uh, to San um, San Antonio, down in Texas. And for the first time, we went to a great big public school. We were just there for three months. And one of the things that was interesting about that school is twice a week, you could go to the library and pick out, I think the maximum we allowed was three books. You could pick out three books that were, looked good to you, take them back and keep them in your room and, and read them. At, at, and my brother and I both just became addicted to books. And then we moved to another place back in Massachusetts, and we had to walk quite a long distance to school every day, a smaller school, but we had to walk right past the public library. So we got library cards, and we started, we just, you know, we just inhaled books. Um, anyway, and I think that was a really, you know, had an enormous impact us on us in our childhood. Um, Surely that was the case with Joseph. His success was certainly not because of his genetics. Think of his brothers and his ancestors. There were liars, thieves, adulterers, etc. in his family. They exhibited jealousy, greed, and bitterness. When they recognized that Joseph was the favored son, they wanted to get rid of him. Joseph was sold into slavery at the age of 17, Genesis 37, 2. As we read earlier, According to Genesis 41, 46, he was 30 years old when he was taken out of the prison and made an advisor to Pharaoh. And there's Genesis 41, 46. Joseph was 30 years old when he began to serve the king of Egypt. He left the king's courtyard, court and traveled all over the land. Hmm. Well, Canaan in those days was 
a part of Egypt. Did he travel to Canaan? I've got to make a trip up to Canaan, you know. Yeah. You guys come with me and we'll go yeah, see if there's, yes. you know, see if we can get some grain from up there too. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's my father's place. Yeah, right. Joseph had learned many lessons, some from his early childhood, many from his time with Potiphar, and then more during his preeminence in Egypt. But the important thing was, his maintain, was he maintained a close relationship with his God. Mm. There's a quotation attributed to Aristotle which might summarize in some details the life of Joseph. Excellence is never an accident. It is always the result of high intention, sincere effort, and intelligent exertion. It represents the wise choice of many alternatives. Choice, not chance, determines your destiny. And that's in, that's, you can access that by looking up Aristotle's quotes that changed the Western history on the internet. And you can get that on our website, by the way, and, and just by asking for one of these handouts. Um, and we'll mail it to you or tell you where you can download it from theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and right there will be the key to where you can find it in the, in the internet. As it turned out, and despite the difficulties along the way, Joseph's trials and difficulties prepared him for the position that he would later occupy in life. Trials and obstacles are the Lord's chosen methods of discipline. Charles, I think you mentioned something like that, didn't you? His appointed conditions of success. He who reads the hearts of men knows their characters better than they themselves know them. The fact that we are called upon to endure trial shows that the Lord Jesus sees in us something precious which he desires to develop. If he saw in us nothing worth but whereby he might glorify his name, he would not spend time in refining us. He does not cast worthless stones into his furnace. It is valuable ore that he refines. The blacksmith puts the iron and steel into the fire that he may know what manner of metal they are. The Lord allows his chosen ones to be placed in the furnace of affliction to prove what temper they are of and whether they can be fashioned for his work. Ministry of Healing 471. Joseph determined, we noticed that earlier, to keep God as a central guiding star in his life. Many years later, Isaiah wrote some words about that. Jim? Isaiah 43, verses 1 to 4. Israel, the Lord who created you, says, do not be afraid, I will save you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the deep waters, I will be with you. Your troubles will not, be, not overwhelm you. When you pass through fire, you will not be burnt. The hard trials that come will not hurt you. For I am the Lord, your God, the holy God of Israel, who saves you. I will give you Excuse me, I will give up Egypt to set you free. I will give up Ethiopia and Seba. I will give you, excuse me, I will give up whole nations to save your life. Because you are precious to me and because I love you and give you honor. Okay. God will never abandon his children. In fact, he is the one who keeps us alive. Hebrews 10, 30, 13, 5 and Acts 17 in two places. None of us should consider ourselves alienated from the family of God. Ephesians 2, 19 and 20, Carrie? Yes. So then, you Gentiles are not foreigners or strangers any longer. You are now fellow citizens with God's people and members of the family of God. You too are built upon the foundation laid by the apostles and prophets, the cornerstone being Christ Jesus himself. That's from Good News Bible. And, and Charles? Galatians 3, 28, 29. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. Between men and women. Hmm. Yes. I think there are some differences. Not in, the, <laughs> not in terms of salvation. Yeah, there you are. Not in terms of being family of God. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. 
if you belong to Christ, there are, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. Do you think you have trials in any way close to the magnitude of what Joseph faced? Do you believe God could guide your life as he guided Joseph's? Are you preparing for what is coming on this earth? I'm going to ask you, we've got just a couple minutes left. How many different key events in the, in the life of Joseph, we've already talked about some of them, you think that were key to him turning out the way he was? I'll start off. He was born to Jacob's favorite wife, the firstborn son to his favorite wife. Jump in. He was favored by his father. Okay. He was. He was a. His. He, he was the son of Jacob. So yes. I mean, that was a privileged position. Okay. He had dreams. Yeah. What happened to those dreams? Gordon, this is your chance to speak up. He told them his dreams, yeah. <laughs> and they were interpreted in a certain way. I mean, think of every single detail that. You know, and that led to his brothers hating him, which led to him being sold. Him he being could have gotten killed. I think it was Reuben who saved him. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yep. He, yes. Some of them wanted him killed. Yes. Simeon, exactly, wanted him. We we'll read more about well, let's, that. Let's, let's put him down in the pit instead, and yeah. I'll, I'll come back later and get him. He was thinking. Yeah. But, Help him out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so on. I mean, we, we could go on and on. I mean, he gets on. He he gets on that. Well, I don't we know. We don't know whether he walked or whether he rode some kind of an animal on his way to Egypt. But on that trip, we read what happened to him. He grew up. He determined what Father. to make his father's God his own God. And then think about the things that happened to him in Egypt. He said, "I'm no, not even before Egypt, though." As he, I think Ellen White mentions it that he could see from far. Yeah. Uh, uh, his the place where he grew up, his yep. father's place. Yep. Okay, a couple more. We're running out of time, but that that this instant decision he made to to reject that wife of Potiphar and then being thrown in prison, he still refused to be disheartened and everything. He 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 interpreted those dreams, and we know where that ended up. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father. We wonder how many events in our lives are like those that we know of and many things we don't know about in the life of Joseph. But just incredible. It just We seem to see your finger touching here and there and there and there and there and there and there leading up to what ended up being salvation for the family of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. What if they had all died in Canaan because of the famine? So, Lord, we know that you are aware of every detail of our lives and you're ready to save us. May that be our experience. May we experience some part of that kind of thing in our lives each day at your hand is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.